Hello everyone and welcome to another session of the Genomic Variant Analysis and Clinical Interpretation course. Today we'll be looking at introduction to constitutional copy number variants and their technical standards for interpretation and reporting. These technical standards are given by a joint consensus recommendation by the ACMG and the ClinGen Resource Group. So before we begin, since today's lecture focuses on copy number variants, let me just introduce what are the general features of CNVs so as to bring all of us on the same page. So there could be multiple types of genetic alterations that could contribute to human variability. And one such variation is copy number variation. The sequence number variations or the uh, single nucleotide variations are some things that uh, are some variations that you have already studied about. Today we'll be looking at copy number variants and these variants account for genome variation and order of magnitude larger than single nucleotide polymorphisms. And these are essential the regions that are duplicated or deleted in some individuals in a population. So these are chunks of your chromosome which could be deleted or duplicated rather than having a single nucleotide polymorphism or a substitution or a deletion or a duplication. So each individual on an average has 1000 CNVs of about close to more than 450 base pairs with respect to the reference genome. And like uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms or variations, these CNVs could also segregate in a population but can also arise de novo. So uh, I'm sure by now that you've been doing uh, SNV um, variation uh, and interpretation by the ACMG guidelines, you would have understood that a variant interpretation um, guidelines and the classification of genomic variant generally requires the integration and assessment of evidence from a variety of sources. It could be literature, it could be computational, and hence this process could be a very subjective in nature. So any variant could be sequence a variation or a copy number variant could have issues with inconsistent interpretation or discordant interpretations in between labs. So hence, for both the groups, the sequence number and the copy number variant um, variants, interpretation guidelines were established to assist laboratories in having a general and consistent interpretation across labs. So, um, from where did it begin? The original uh, CNV interpretation guidelines were uh, initially published in literature way back in 2011. While they did provide guidance on what types of evidence to consider, there were no specific recommendations regarding each type of evaluation and each type of guideline in the overall evaluation. They were just a set of guidelines that were given to look at or um, look at uh, the uh, postnatal constitutional copy number variants. We also need to remember one more point that these came up in a time where chromosomal microarray was being widely accepted into clinical use. But we've come a long way since 2011 and a number of platforms and technologies have evolved. And hence, in 2019, um, now these guidelines have been updated and uh, these were published in 2019 and uh, finally it came out in 2020. So uh, there are a few major features that have been adopted in the new technical standards. The first major uh, feature or the three Actually, there are three major features in the new technical standards. We'll be looking at each uh, one of them one by one um, to summarize in this slide and then eventually in detail towards the uh, future slides. So the first major feature that we've moved on to is to officially adopt a five-tier classification system. Um, now, this is indifferent from that was earlier put forward by Kearney et al. in 2011. Uh, that was essentially a three-tier system wherein the like likely pathogenic and likely benign were clubbed into uncertain significance. But now, like you've also seen um, by Richards et al uh, for the uh, single nucleotide variation uh, ACMG classifications that they have also adapted a similar five tier classification system. So the same applies to CNV classification systems now that uh, we have to eventually classify the CNV into one of these five different classes. It could be pathogenic, likely pathogenic. Um, it could lie into uncertain significance. It could fall into the likely benign or the benign category. So the next major uh, feature of this uh, new technical updated standards is that it helps us uncouple the variant classification from clinical interpretation. Now, these are uh, really two separate concepts that um, uh, 
do we have enough evidence to say that this particular variant causes a particular disease and is this a causative variant is the real cause in my patient so basically does it satisfy the reason for referral in my patient or not so let me help you explain this uh, with the following examples so let's consider a scenario where a loss of function in a particular gene on an x chromosome let's say is known to be associated with a particular disease and you observe the deletion of this particular gene in a male case and a similar deletion in a female case so now um um we might not be able to um so in so in such cases we do need uncoupling of variant classification from clinical interpretation another example could be that you have observed a particular deletion in case of let's say a referral reason for developmental delay and now you observe a similar or let's say a variant is already known to be pathogenic or causative in cases of um, for example developmental delay and now you see a similar deletion or a copy number variant in terms of a patient who's been referred to let's say for something completely unrelated uh, could be hearing loss for example so in in these cases if the evidence were if the evidence wants or warrants the classification of the variant should remain the same so if there is a strong evidence the supporting the link between the loss of function uh, of those particular genes and the disease then the classification of it being pathogenic likely pathogenic or uncertain etc should reflect upon regardless of the context in which it is observed so um due to uh, such um discrepancies or such examples we need to have these uncoupling of variant classification from clinical interpretation so as to decrease the source of inconsistency between labs and also the classification of va variants should not vary regardless of the technology used the third um the third and the uh, final major um a uh, feature of the new technical standards is that they have incorporated a quantitative evidence based evaluation framework and the goal of the framework is to provide more specific guidance to users uh, regarding the weights of particular pieces of evidence in an effort to increase interlaboratory consistency and overall transparency wherever possible and uh, because of uh, these incorporation of these evaluation based frameworks they have tried to eventually align these recommendations with the acmg sequence variant interpretation guidelines as well so um, essentially what these the, what these do is that the guidelines suggest a number of points that are uh, then added or subtracted for each piece of evidence to reflect the relative strength of the particular piece and then uh, once all the evidence pieces are gathered and points are given the sum of um, the total points are then done and then a proposed interpretation is given where as to uh, classify the variant into path likely path uncertain likely benign or benign so um the overall technical standards are divided into five major sections and each section consists of different sub labels so each uh, sub label is given by a two letter code that is 1a 1b uh, corresponding to the section and the uh, criteria that is being set so these 1a 1b are analogous to the criteria that we give or you have understood now in the acmg snv guidelines like bp1 pvs1 pm3 etc so the same uh, analogous uh, terms in cnv interpretation guidelines are 1a 1b 2a 2b etc we'll see them in uh, in our coming slides so the first thing that one needs to uh, look at when we are looking at oh one more uh, important point that we need to remember is that uh, these guidelines are different for deletions and duplications but for interest of time we'll be looking at only deletions for now however they are very similar in nature so uh, if you have understood the deletions guidelines the duplication guidelines will not be uh, so much of a problem so the first immediate thing that one needs to do when evaluating a deletion is to consider its gene content and determine if there is anything within uh, the deletion that we are seeing that can be evaluated further or does it not contain any uh, protein coding genes or any known functionally important elements so uh, if do, if we do have uh, 
protein coding or known functionally important elements, then we do need to uh, direct ourselves to further uh, further evidences uh, to either support the pathogenicity or refute pathogenicity. But if it does not contain any protein coding um, elements or functionally known important elements, we uh, help uh, we classify the variant into uh, 1b and uh, in these scenarios there may not be enough evidence to interrogate about the genomic region as no genes are uh, present within uh, the um, within the CNV that we are studying. So um, the default classification that one uh, sets here is of uncertainty and it is recommended in the default score that is given, but we could also look at additional information that could uh, move the CNV either to a pathogenic or benign by uh, maybe looking at inheritance patterns or maybe looking at uh, family histories or maybe also looking at uh, population scale data to classify this type of CNV into either benign or likely benign. So um, once we uh, look at this initial context, the sec we have to move to the second section. Now, before we move on to second section, we need to understand a concept that is known as dosage sensitivity. So dosage sensitivity is a model whereby um, it tells you whether a 50% increase or decrease in a gene copy number is deleterious. So essentially what happens is that dosage sensitive genes may be in stoichiometric balance with other genes. So there could be uh, genes that may have a minimum concentration that might be required to achieve a desired effect or they could they could also act in a concentrated uh, dependent fashion or they could be they could be also they could also produce proteins which are uh, prone to aggregation at higher concentrations so uh, such genes uh, when uh, the dosage of these genes is changed because of an overlapping CNV. The function of a gene is disrupted in a way that we may observe a disease. So in such cases, um, we need to evaluate for dosage sensitivity. And um, ideally what uh, happens is that because uh, they are uh, more accurately dosage sensitive genes can may never be observed in cnvs even pathogenic ones so if they are so disruptive uh, they are likely to result in inviability so uh, ideally they are uh, so ideally duplication and or loss of uh, CNVs are not expected to be observed in healthy individuals. If we are observing it in our individual, then it may be uh, an indication that they might lead to a disease. So uh, now that we've understood the concept of dosage uh, sensitivity, we need to uh, go, go to section two. And in section two, we have to look at whether our observed CNV overlaps with any established uh, or predicted haploinsufficiency gene or the other way around. Does it overlap with a benign or a a benign gene or a genomic region. So there could be two possibilities that our interest, uh, our CNV of interest or our deletion of interest in this case could overlap with an already established region where, where you have genes which are already known to be dosage sensitive or there could be another uh, another scenario where our uh, gene, our deletion or CNV overlaps with a region which is already established to be a benign genomic region. All right. So now uh, let's look at the first case where it overlaps with a complete, um, uh, where there's a complete overlap of our CNV with an established uh, haploinsufficiency or gene or a genomic region. Now, when this, uh, now how do we know whether uh, our gene of, in, our uh, genomic region of interest or where, where whatever deletion we do we have, uh, does it even con consists of dosage sensitive genes? So to look at that, we uh, the the guidelines refer to Clingen dosage sensitivity map that is a public resource by Clingen on their website. Now in this, they have already established uh, the genes that are uh, 
either they are dosage sensitive or they are established benign uh, genes and we just have to search our region of interest by either gene or by the location uh, in the in the web server of clingen and look at uh, if there is a complete overlap between our cnv and the established uh, haploinsufficient gene or genomic region so if there is a complete overlap we give it a score of 2 uh, if we assign the criteria 2a and give it the corresponding recommended score however there could also be uh, specific scenarios where there could be partial overlaps of our uh, cnv with the uh, established haploinsufficient genes so for example there could be overlap of the 5 prime end and um, there could be overlap of only the uh, five prime. Uh, it could be the five prime end that could be involved, or it could be the three prime end that could be involved. Within those, uh, within those also, you could have specific subcategories where you could look at whether the um, whether it includes other exons in addition to the last exon, whether there is nonsense mediated decay is expected to occur or not that that is not going to occur so such special considerations can uh, are also listed in the section uh, two um so like i told you that there could be um, so just to recap there could be an uh, overlap of our cnv with an established region which is haploinsufficient that we look at by the clinton dosage sensitivity map so now there could be again two categories two criteria in between there could be a complete overlap or there could be a partial overlap if there is complete overlap we give it a criteria of 2a now if there is partial overlap we could have these subsections within which there could be partial overlap within the five prime region three prime region or any last exon or nonsense mediated decay is expected to occur or not so such considerations need to be specially taken and corresponding points are need to are recommended to be assigned where there could be partial overlaps now there could also be the second criteria where it doesn't overlap with the uh, genomic region which is an established haploinsufficient region but it is a uh, established benign a genomic region so if there is a complete overlap of our cnv with an already established benign cnv region we definitely have to downgrade our cnv and enough points are deducted to classify to basically help get the classification of the uh, cnv towards the benign category like for example in 2f however if again there is an uh, overlap of um, the cnv with an established benign uh, cnv from again the clinton dosage sensitivity map but it also includes additional genomic material then a criteria of 2g is given and we have to continue our evaluation further now there could be specific haploinsufficiency predictors that could be present or rcnb could overlap with those uh, regions which could be predictors of haploinsufficiency so now this a particular criteria is analogous to the computational um, um, attributes of the uh, SNB ACMG, if you remember, wherein we know that they could be predicted um, pathogenic or deleterious, but we do not have enough evidence to say that. So uh, only by assigning these scores is not going to help us classify our CNV into either pathogenic or likely pathogenic. These could only serve as supporting evidences, um, just like uh, computational attributes in C uh, SNV ACMG guidelines. So to look at whether our region is a put is could could be containing um, uh, haploinsufficiency predictors we use the website of decipher and uh, we look at uh, hi scores or pli scores given by the decipher web, uh, web server and then eventually uh, give right give our um, recommended scores to that particular uh, area if it does contain haploinsufficiency predictors uh, so just remember that we should not be using uh, these predictors alone um, as a standalone criteria, but should always be used as a supporting uh, criteria. 
now moving on to section 3 this is a very important section where uh, it helps us look at the evaluation of the gene number or the number of genes that are present in our deletion and uh, in general we do understand that larger the cnv more would be the number of genes and hence by general understanding we would take it closer to being pathogenic or likely pathogenic but in these guidelines they have specified a particular threshold number on to how many genes do we use as a cutoff and these are derived from a previously uh, work done and analysis done by ritter et al and eventually um, by giving each of the um, criteria so as to like for example if our deletion consists of genes uh, gene number that are uh, that lies between 0 to 24 we give it a particular score 25 to 34 and uh, more than 35 genes are uh, will help us uh, classify our cnv to the uh, close to the likely pathogenic um, scoring of our cnv so um, we have to uh, give this particular section as a very important uh, section of our acmg scoring guidelines and uh, then if we remember in section 2 we looked at our gene of interest and looked at uh, whether our G, uh, whether our cnv overlaps with an established uh, dosage sensitive region or does it overlap with the established benign region now if there were no overlaps with any of those regions we move to section 4 but if we have had overlaps or we have assigned section 2 in our to our cnvs we have to skip this section and move to section 5 so um let's say our cnv did not have any overlap and we did not assign any criteria in section 2 now if we don't if we have not assigned any criteria in section 2 we will look at section 4 wherein we have to do a detailed evaluation of the genomic content using published literature public databases or we can also use internal uh, data now uh, in this section in this particular section we award points on how specific is the phenotype of interest with respect to what is being seen in the literature and we also have to consider the inheritance patterns that we see uh, and so on and so forth we will run through all of these uh, sections when we look at uh, when we do the acmg of a particular cnv through an example in our next session but uh, just remember that if we do not assign any criteria to section 2 we go to section 4 and if we have assigned the section 2 criteria where we are cnv did overlap with an established hi region then we have to skip to section 5 okay and along in this section along with individual case evidences we do have to consider segregation data amongst the uh, family members that are that that were seen in literature and uh, uh, of a considerate or a conservative approach to follow um, that the guidelines say is that only assign the segregation criteria when genotype or a genotype is also present and the phenotype is also present or there could be an obligate carrier uh, that we suspect in the pedigree and um, again only by looking at segregations we cannot assign criteria we have to assign criteria based on the number of segregations that we see so if there are 3 to 4 uh, observed segregations and uh, we have to note that these segregations are added across families so uh, across families we can add segregations and if we are looking at a bigger pedigree we can look at all the segregations and if there are 3 to 4 uh, observed segregations we can uh, assign it a score that is 0.15 and so on and so forth so with increased segregations the score increases and helps us uh, classify this uh, uh, cnv towards the pathogenic side because there is a clear segregation that can be observed so uh, apart from these there could also so uh, that was based on case evidences now there could also be reports where there are case control comparisons and there is a population evidence of the cnv to be either benign or pathogenic so a general rule that we follow is uh, in terms of single nucleotide polymorphisms or cnvs is that if there is a cnv that is present greater than 1% in a population uh, we will consider it as a polymorphism or we will downgrade it to the benign category only if it is present less than 1% in a population scale evidence we do consider it to be a rare cnv and we will um, classify it to be towards the pathogenic side so 
um, if there are no case control reports, there could be other ways of looking at population scale uh, CNV frequency data where we could look at um, databases such as NOMAD uh, and DGV, which I will show in a bit. Uh, these are uh, population scale reference uh, population CNVs that are documented in these databases. And they also reveal uh, allele frequency based on controls or cases or what is being seen in a general population. So NOMAD is one such browser that we can look at uh, to look at our particular CNV's allele frequency. The another one is DGV. This is database of genomic variations, and um, that also reports the allele frequency of that particular CNV in the general population. So by looking at these, we could uh, avoid points on how specific the phenotype is and how is it uh, um, seen with respect to cases control studies or how does the CNV look like in a population scale data. Now, uh, finally, uh, we have to consider, uh, so if section four is done, so that is in case if, if you did not have a section two. Now, towards section five, we have to look at individual case or the case that we are being, that, that we are um, currently studying and look for inheritance because this is also going to serve as an additional case or a additional piece of evidence with this, uh, just like uh, we had literature case evidences. So, um, Again, in our case of interest, if we do uh, see that the observed copy number loss is a de novo confirmed uh, type of segregation, we will uh, use de novo strategies like we did in case of literature evidences, like uh, it was uh, mentioned in section four. Um, however, if the copy number cost, uh, copy number loss is inherited and it is specific with the well-defined phenotype, but it doesn't have a family history or it is being uh, inherited from an apparently unaffected par parent, we will uh, try to downgrade the CNV uh, towards by deducting uh, points, but if it does uh, segregate or is consistent, we will again uh, use segregation scoring strategy from section four to determine its eventual score. However, if there is no inheritance available, we, there are points to be assigned for those as well. And once we complete this section, we have to add on to all our points could be negative, could be positive, and then come up with a final point. And uh, like I, I had shown in my first slide, eventually finalize the score. And then the final score is used to classify the proposed um, criteria could be pathogenic, likely pathogenic, it could fall into uncertain, it could fall into likely benign or benign. So just like you have um, a final classifier in the SNP um, ACNG guidelines. We also have a CNV calculator, which is given by the Clingen resource, which helps us assign or uh, give ads, uh, basically tick all our attributes and then helps us calculating the sum of all the scores that we have assigned and eventually lead to what could be the classification of our particular CNV. So this is the overall brief introduction to the various sections that are mentioned in the technical standards for interpreting CNVs. And um, I hope uh, you've got a gist of uh, what all do we have to cover. In the next session, we will take up one particular CNV and look at uh, each of the section and assign each attribute to it and eventually uh, help classify that particular CNV in one of those cr uh, criteria that um, we just saw. So I hope this was useful. And if there are any questions, please uh, write back to us and we'll be happy to uh, help you with those. And thank you and see you in the next session.